You're listening to the Cantina Cast. Your home for thought provoking Star Wars talk. Join Adler and Jonesy in breaking down the latest news, trailers, movies, and of course, your favorite characters from a galaxy far, far away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cantina Cast. My name is Albert Padilla, and this is episode 387 Star Wars Visions Part 1. I think we're calling this series Reflections, but this will be the first of three episodes dedicated to the recent series by, uh, well, a, a number of different animators from Japan. We've uh, been waiting uh, for this on bated breath for the better part of, God knows, like since December of last year. So it's finally here uh, and we got a lot to say. So, again, this will be the first of three episodes where we're, we're going to break down the first three. And um, when we're all done with this. We're going to leave you with uh, Ronin. So we'll kind of roll right into Ronin at this, and, and that'll kind of wrap up all of our visions covered. Um, and and the person with the vision, oh, look at that, that was cheesy, uh, is Jonesy. Jonesy, welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight? Doing well, man. A few minutes late, but we're right on time. We arrived, yeah. we arrived right when we meant to. It's fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. So we're, we are a little bit late, but we had uh, I had to get coffee. Uh, by the way, tonight's uh, show is sponsored by Dunkin' Donuts. They paid us no money. Uh, this is just a shameless plug because I really enjoy Dunkin' Donuts. He has, um, a, he has an unhealthy obsession with Dunkin' Donuts. It is really unhealthy. It really uh, is. In, in many ways. Um, if, only yeah, that, so, if only all that were true, though, that we could have sponsorship. <laughs> yeah, we don't. We're not that big yet. No. Yet. Yep. Give us another 20 years, another uh, 380 something episodes, and we'll be right there with you guys. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it looks like we got a lot of. Uh, celebrities uh, in our chat already so thank you guys for being here and um we're gonna roll right into this uh because yeah. there's well i don't think we don't do we even get we have any news uh, we'll pick nothing, that up next week yeah we'll, we'll kind of catch up next week nothing super out of this world yeah yeah all right we'll do that next week but um all right so i want to get your thoughts on this because i've seen a lot of chatter about star wars visions um most of it i would say at least in my circles have been pretty positive yeah. Um, I think you're still going to have the Phantom Menace that will find anything horrible to say about it. They, it was like it would just seem like whatever. I mean, the, even the people that I felt like were that were kind of like, OK, I'm kind of on board with anime Star Wars, then just tore it apart, like didn't even give it a chance. So it was like you really weren't ever on board with this at all. You were just kind of, you know, playing to your crowd or, or make I don't know what they were doing, really, uh, right, probably yeah. getting votes and likes and downloads or whatever else. But uh, so give me your thoughts to uh, just in general overall on the series. Um, you know, what did you think of it? Um, you know, and what did you like? What did you not like? And we'll get into some other aspects as well before we get into the first one, the duel. Yeah, I really like the visual, oh man, just the visual variety we got from all of this. I mean, there are mm -hmm. very, very unique styles pretty much in every single episode. And as a, as a very visual person, especially colors and it's just, it was really cool to see that it was a very, each story was also very, very different from a storytelling aspect as well, which I thought was unique, right? We were, it's very different. It's, it's hard. I found myself having a difficult time adjusting to it because I expect to get a very linear storyline, right? We're, we're just used to these very direct ways of, of storytelling, maybe a little jumping back and forth on some of the books, but really you are, you have a start and you have an end point, even if your end point kind of jumps to another book or something like that mm -hmm. so that part took a little bit of getting used to and again with the short timeline you know, with the sh short episode or uh time of this that's kind of difficult to really get a whole story in there sometimes and so there were some where they had really you know kind of really good end and uh episodes that really had a kind of a full story and then there's others like the duel where if you don't have ronin the book the duel has very little story to it of what you see on in the episode, which was a little bit surprising. I expected to have a bit more of a complete episode from, from most of these when that mm -hmm. always wasn't the case, but there were some really, really good episodes. And we're going to talk about a couple to, or we're going to talk about the first three tonight, but really each of these three segments we're going to do, there are really good episodes in there, no matter what walk of life you're, you're, you're from or you're going to it. They're really good. What about you? What was your initial impression of them? So I think, I think overall I'm with you, I think I, I really enjoy them. It was, I mean, if nothing else, my, my goodness, you can't, you cannot, uh, stress how different this was, right? Yeah. The title visions was aptly titled. They were, 
a lot of these episodes, some of them felt like they could really truly exist in canon. And some of them were so far out there that there's no way. And that necessarily wasn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we had talked about this before. There was the, um, what was the one that you always forget? You always remember the name and I never remember the name, but the comic book, uh, that series that they did where they took, um, he was like, what if the, what if Luke oh, hadn't blown up the Death Star? Infinities, Infinites. yeah. Infinites, I think is what it was. Star Infinities, Wars yeah. Okay, Infinities. Uh, that one, that was like, uh, that was kind of a take on that. And we got to see that play out. Uh, this one had a lot of that same feel. We're like, ooh, this is kind of cool. It's very different. But to your point, the one thing that I think was, I would say was a, I wouldn't say a drawback or a downer or any, anything like that. Because, I mean, what do you expect for like 15 minutes, right? It wasn't right. these long episodes. And maybe that was part of it. <laughs> maybe it should have been. But because there were 15 minutes and because you, like you said, they were, you were kind of just dropped in the middle of something that had happened, a lot that had happened before, a lot that was going to happen when it was over. And we just got this small, very small slice of what was really happening in that timeline right then and there. That one kind of at times left you wanting more, which is what we said. I mean, we'll talk about that here in just a minute too, but uh, it felt like there's, there's more to be told in all of these stories. Some of them, uh, as far as visually, um, you know, and again, we, I'm not an, uh, I'm a passive at best anime person. So, and I, some of the people that I, that are in my, again, in my circles, were talking about, oh my gosh, you know, the ninth Jedi was exactly like this particular style that so-and-so does, right? The directors and the anime, I mean, they know everything about it. And so for those people, I think they, they got a more enriching experience than, than this, maybe I did. Mine was very surface level. It was like, oh yeah, it all looks like anime. I acknowledge that there are a lot of different flavors of anime, a lot of different styles of anime. Um, so to that extent, I don't really, I didn't really get to appreciate, I probably didn't appreciate the different styles and the types and, and all of that. It was all kind of visual candy for me. So all, I would say all of it felt like anime. It's looked like anime. Uh, I don't think there was any of it in terms of the way it was graphically drawn that he couldn't, that I couldn't appreciate in some way, uh, which is not a, again, not a knock, but I guess, yeah, my only, my only feedback was it did, there wasn't enough there for me. Like I really wanted more. Uh, now, so on that note. You know, again, I said this two months or three months when the trailer first came out, I said, just do call it. Go ahead and call season two now because <laughs> it's going to have to happen. And to, I think it was yesterday on Twitter. And I forget who it was. It was one of the producers said that they were definitely in talks already for or it's quite possible. They were kind of leaving it open that, yeah, they, they probably are going to do a season two. And I would say that given the response and the reception of this, even with all the negatives, uh, there were enough people here that were very, very interested. So I wouldn't be surprised if we certainly see a season two, but I wonder if they are going to take the approach they did with Ronin and expand upon either stories prior to what we saw today or kind of follow up uh, with some storyline from some of those smaller segments that we saw. I really like that. I'd, I'd like for them to do some unique content if they come into a season two. and But also, like you said, pick up some of these stories that clearly have more to tell or had more to come in front of it. And I, I think one thing we have to keep in perspective, though, is the point of visions, at least from an American audience, is to really expose people to a completely different way of doing things and, mm -hmm. and a different visual style. And I think it was a, absolutely successful in that way. And you pick up people who now appreciate that style or they enjoyed it. Sometimes they really like the over the top stuff. They, you know, we, we never had this in Star Wars, right, where you just have something so wildly over the top. We had a little bit of it with the uh, with the shorts, right? Uh, what were they called? Galaxy of Adventures. Mm, yeah, a, yeah. A little bit. That's about as close as we've ever really gotten, though, right? Aside from just normal cartoon antics. Yeah. And, but so it, mission accomplished. I mean, these were the things it was supposed to do, bring a completely different way of storytelling, very, very different visualization style, and, you know, set it out there and let people enjoy it and, you know, leverage all of this, this, this entire culture of, of anime that many of us have, like like you were saying, either very limited exposure or, or really absolutely none. And I, I think there are some really great things in all of this that people, either from a story aspect or just visually, that, that they can really grab onto and enjoy. So I'm a little bit, I'm not surprised there's been negative feedback because the fandom is what it is sometimes. But at the same time, I hope people are at least being very objective about some of their you know criticism or some of their you know, their feedback on it. Yeah, and I think if for me, and maybe this is the final thing before we jump into the first one here, I think there were certainly ones that I liked a lot more than other words. Like it was, yeah. like I appreciate all of them and I'm glad that we got all of them. And I mean, really, 14 minutes is not a huge time commitment. So it's not right. like, oh my gosh, I had to watch 14 minutes. I mean, it's like, it's really, <laughs> really, I mean, you would have been gotten through the first episode in no time. So right. um, and I think the I longest think, was what, 22 minutes? 
Well, yeah, and that's 22 with credits too. I mean, it wasn't even yeah. like 22. I think after you you know pull, pull that off, it's still like at 18 or something like that. Right. So it really wasn't a huge time commitment there. Um, so I, I think, uh, so yeah, I would say there were certainly ones that I really like. And I think for me, again, I'm not a big, huge anime fan. So, and I, and I noticed there were 20, 30 years ago, <laughs> okay, five, 10 years, no, 20, 30 years ago, um, there were things I, when I was watching and getting into anime, there were certain styles that I was like, oh, I really like this style, right? Or there's certain storylines that just kind of resonated with me. And we got such a, like you said, a very well-rounded gambit of different types of stories that it was easy for me to, I felt like, okay, yes, this reaffirmed that I don't like these types of styles as much, or I don't like storylines that are so embedded, like in the nature stuff, which is, you know, we talked about Shintoism and how prom, uh, uh, predominant that is in, ja in Japan right. and, and some of the cultural um, leniencies there. Uh, but so for some of that, for that, a lot, it was, a, it was a big reaffirmation about anime in general for me. And there's, again, there's certain episodes that I really want a lot of. And there are certain ones that I was kind of like, me, well, I, I could really do without. It's totally fine. Right. Uh, but so uh, before we go, I want you just to kind of give me, if you had to give me your top three, and not necessarily in any particular order, but just what were the top three that stood out for you of the nine? Oh, man. So I really liked Ninth Jedi a lot. And I know Chef Chris down in the chat was hoping we were talking about that tonight, but you'll have to wait probably a couple of weeks here. But <laughs> Ninth Jedi I liked a lot because it kind of had everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the elder was pretty good uh, there was i liked there were moments that i really enjoyed about that one one i was surprised i liked a lot more with, were actually two one is tonight to uh, tattooing rhapsody i liked a lot and <laughs> mike ronda is gonna have a fit i uh, know right and, and the other one i really <laughs> liked was uh the village bride i thought that was fantastic as well it was just really different it was a bit slower pace but it was just mm -hmm. really just different and it was one that was kind of a dark horse uh one i thought might be i would, I would like and again, I have to admit, I haven't seen two of the nine yet, so I haven't quite got through all of them as I've been watching and rewatching the ones we were going to do. Yeah. But, um, and I've, just so everyone's aware, I have now been fired and banned. Yeah, sorry. We're, um, excuse me one second. Uh, okay, yes, we're getting word that Jonesy has been fired from the show. You heard it here first. Jonesy has been fired from the show. Jonesy, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you guys next time. Um, okay, so, no, so I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> I, I nice made him effect, disappear. Though. I like that. Yeah. Game. That's great. Taking you right off the air. Pulling you. There's, we just missed the cane. Like there should have been a cane that came and just dragged you right off stage left there. Right. Um, Exit stage uh, so, left. So what's your top three? <laughs> um, so I'm really not that deep. <laughs> I like, <laughs> like I liked all the flashy lightsabers and stuff. Like I really, so here's, here's an interesting thing. One of the ones we're going to talk about tonight is uh, the twins. And yeah. I really, really was looking forward to that one. I really wanted to like that one because I think of all of them. It felt like that was the um, – it looked more like uh, Galaxy of Adventures, right, in terms of the style and the animation, yeah. which I really th thought was awesome. And uh, I didn't I didn't really like it as much. In fact, it was probably one of, one towards the bottom. And I've got some other problems because my ex-girlfriend, who uh, I know we didn't really – she doesn't know that we dated. But my ex-girlfriend, Allison Bree, <laughs> did the voice for um, the sister. Uh, was it Am is her name? Yeah. And uh, I didn't like her. Well, we'll get into that in here in a little. I don't want to steal my thunder on that one. But right. so my top three, though, to answer your question, um, I like the duel a lot. Silas, I'm a huge, you guys know, huge Kira, uh, Kira Kurosawa fan. Uh, that was right out of the 50s and 60s samurai movies. All of even movies that were aside from Kira Kurosawa, there was a lot of other ones that were going on. He wasn't the only one that was making them, but right. there was a lot of um, callbacks to a lot of those samurai movies that I've seen and absolutely enjoyed uh, that one. Uh, so that was one of the ones, uh, like you, the ninth Jedi was probably my favorite, um, probably a close tie between the duel and the ninth Jedi. The ninth Jedi just had so much that came before and so much that's coming afterwards that my, right. my gosh, we've got to know, I've got to know what's happening in that storyline. But they still and had so much in the story, which was I know, so yeah. fantastic no, it was, it. it was yeah. great. Absolutely. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. It had way more in it, substance in it than even the duel, right? Cause the duel is just kind of like bunch yeah, we'll, of people we'll and talk about that one <laughs> yeah um and then i guess the the third one i don't know i'm probably torn um between the what was the one you mentioned i'm drawing blank on the name um village bride was village bride is, is rhapsody pretty no no i did not like oh. that really but the, Man, i thought it was that would a, been right up your alley uh, no i not enough journey if, if it was more 80s rock or synth then fine <laughs> i would have been all in but uh, now, well, we'll, get to, we'll talk about it here. We'll just, right. I'll save it. Um, I didn't totally hate it, but it was not my cup of tea. Um, yeah, probably the, the, uh, no, the elder probably. 
Yeah, Elder was. Yeah, Elder was really good. I'm, I'm gonna go those my th my three. Elder is the third one because and just quickly on that one, it very much reminded me of like you know Master and Apprentice that whole relationship. It was a little bit slower, but there was a lot more dialogue, and I, I think it's because I'm on this the High Republic kick and just that relationship between Master and Apprentice and how uh, nurturing it is, uh, during that time. And it felt like there was more of that same here. So, yeah. Um, okay. So <laughs> I just got a raise. Uh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Thank you. Wow. I appreciate that. Man, I feel all the love here, Mike. <laughs> okay. From so, nothing to nothing. Right. Japanese or English then? I, I will always say that the Japanese, the Japanese versions were much better in my opinion. Like, even though I didn't know what they were saying and I had to sit down and read the subtitles, right? The whole entire, I, so I watched these, I watched all the Japanese versions first and it was super, like even the ones that I was kind of like, yeah, like even like uh tattooing Rhapsody, when you watch that one, the Japanese version just to me sounded better. And the characters seemed more natural. It seemed like it was a more fitting, uh, the voice actors seemed more fitting for the Japanese version than it did for the American version. Right. Uh, and so I would say the Japanese versions to this, they always seem to be better for me. Uh, but when I'm, you know, when it's two in the morning and I really don't want to read stuff, I'm going to default to like, if I was to ever watch these again, I'm going to watch them probably in the U S version. Right. right. But if I really want the full experience, the, the native experience, if you will. Um, and I don't mean that. In a, I don't mean that. I mean, native in this, like the way it was originally recorded, right. I'm going to go with the Japanese versions. But what about you? Which ones did you like more? English hands down. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the Japanese, it's very distracting for me because they, they talk so fast in order to get all of the words in. And you just know that the things they're saying are too, like the subtitles are all rearranged because of the, the way the language works. And you know, they're just not quite syncing up uh, that well. And I actually have the other, uh, kind of on the other side of the coin, some of the voices I didn't find were very, they didn't match the characters as well as I thought. Now I watched it in English first and then went back and watched it in Japanese. Interesting. So, yeah, so some of them I were much more aligned with what I ex expected, like Guy, of all, of all people on Tatooine Rhapsody. I much rather his English version than the, as, as well as Jay. Jay. Uh, yeah, but so, it, but it was, it was like that, but it's, it's really just the rapid speaking, just how fast they talk. And, and in order to get it all in, they're just, do they ever take a breath? Do they have to breathe? Because I just really, I, those are genuine questions because I don't think, they, I think they could just say, 5,000 words and not take a breath. And it's amazing to me that mm -hmm. they can do it. Yeah. So. I, I, yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. There's, it is a, it's, a, it's so rapid. I will say this too. When you watch, if you ever, if you go back and watch these in, on the English tracks and throw up the subtitles, the subtitles are all kinds of screwy. Yeah. They're all like wrong. They're not, they're not, yeah. What the heck happened? I mean, I don't know. It's not like they've not had time to put this together, but the subtitles are really bad guys. I mean, it's like, there are people talking in English and there's nothing on the screen. And I'm like, oh, what happened? What happened? To they just disappear. They're always, they're lagging behind. Sometimes they're not translated right. So yeah, it's weird. just as a, a hey, as a weird aside. Yeah, they had the wrong words numerous times in the mm -hmm. episode. It wasn't like it was, I mean, we're not being nitpicky. I mean, it was fairly consistent, but there were caption issues throughout the whole things. So. Yeah. All right. Well, Let's get into the duel. Um, and this one's brought up, uh, brought to us by the Kamikaze Duga. And I'm going to put this up on the screen so you can kind of see. We're not going to watch it uh, because the show will come down in, like so fast. <laughs> like, <laughs> they'll, they'll pull this thing on us so fast. So we'll just kind of step through it if we need to. But um, for, as far as the, the, as far as the voice actors in this one, um, you had Brian Lee as Ronan. We're not going through all these, but Brian Lucy T. Lou. Yeah, T. Yep. Brian T, sorry, yeah, as Ronan. Uh, Lucy Liu, uh, which I didn't realize that was her voice until she sounded very different. Yeah, yeah, she said she sounded much, much different. I like, um, and I like the voice that she came up with. It was really good. And I'm sure all of these people are very famous and popular. I know a lot of the actor voice actors have done a lot of anime. Uh, so again, having not really, I'm not. It's not really part of my culture, and I don't really watch it. I mean, my U.S. culture, I don't really watch a lot of it at all. So I don't know a lot of these people. But again, I know a lot of people have said, "Oh yeah, that's." so-and-so in this particular series and you know these guys are uh well known but i um yeah i thought the voice acting was okay like it was fine i mean there was nothing there was nothing that was different or um jarring for me with the voice actors i think everybody did a really good job some of the troopers um, were a little over the top but yeah well, yeah yeah i would yeah that's I really the, the commander that came off the what was so it was like an adat walker body on wheels mm -hmm. which was really pretty cool i thought that was a 
a very different way of, of approaching that unit. Well, and, and yeah, and I think it's, I, that's why I want to see the style more because while it was a quote samurai film where it was, you know, set up like a samurai film and I've not read Ronin, by the way, I've only read the first like four chapters. You've basically read the duel. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I think we've got two days until we can even talk about it. So I can't say much, that, even what I know, but I will say uh, I did like what they, I like, I like what they did in the cart in this anime where they took, like you said, that uh, the body of the Adak on wheels, and then you had the Doug that was running, like flying around in a probe droid right. that had swords on every one of the arms. Like, man, this is so crazy. It's like a, you know, they've mixed all this stuff up, or um, they look like kind of like bandits, right? They had salvaged all this stuff that right. was pre, uh, post war, and they were using it uh, in that way. That that in itself is really fascinating to me. So, well, and the Trandoshan's body armor was just, I mean so inspired from you know from samurai and things like that it was just mm -hmm. really really cool to see how well they in integrated this thing but stylistically this thing was like you like you were saying this is like a blast from our childhood of yeah. what we grew up with on tv seeing and just this this really beautiful style of of cinematography in a lot of ways and it was just i mean you, you probably could talk about for days but just the way that they the introduction of it i mean you said it, you know it goes into a star field but when you go to the in the planet side Man, it's just like this almost three dimensional black and white with just a hint of sepia tone in there, and mm -hmm. you know it was just fantastic. I love that they used you know the Japanese lettering; it didn't translate it at all. And so I thought those were, I thought those were a lot of fun and just really cool. You really got into the spirit of it right away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so before we get too far ahead of ourselves, uh, quickly on the synopsis, uh, in case you have not read or whatever reason. Uh, while resting at a small village, a Ronin lightsaber warrior is caught up in the middle of an attack by a group of post-war bandits led by a Sith. After dispatching the Sith and the bandits, thanks in part to Ronin's R2 unit, Ronin leaves the village chief a red kyber crystal to ward off evil before he and his droid wander off again. Uh, and the way, uh, yeah, I did enjoy that this one, like, there's, there's certain things that are like Star Wars to me. And always opening up like this on a, a Starfield is always Star Wars. Um, I think there were a couple of them that did this. Um, and, and sorry, I forgot to mention this too. And I want to just, so out of the gate, the whole series is truly a love letter to George Lucas and Star Wars. It really is. Like it is, they, I mean, it, there's no shame about using, uh, I have a bad feeling about this or the sound effects or, I mean, it was their opportunity to go out there and finally be able to draw these things and say these, write these things in a script and have somebody say them and say, I wrote that, you know what I'm saying? Like this was, right. I mean, and, and there's so much passion that went into it. And I know there was a lot of, uh, you know, there was some feedback of, man, there's a lot of kyber crystal heavy type stories here. Well, yeah, because kyber crystals are kind of a big thing and swords are a kind of a big thing in when you're talking about samurais and stuff. So a lot of the same themes were happening. A lot of the same things were being said. Uh, saying that there was a lot of droids. I mean, they were really just kind of pulling all the stuff that they grew up with and throwing it in here and just having fun with it. And so um, that's why you kind of saw some of that. But this is this is definitely one of the things to me is, you know, this whole background of a Starfield. Uh, you know, the I love the fact that they, they did the lettering there uh, for the duel, but they did it in Orobosh, but it looks like it's, you know, in mm -hmm. painted paintbrush right. kind of uh, lettering there, either katakana, hiragana, or whatever Japanese language they're using. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, so when you said earlier about, I was just kind of gushing on all this stuff. A lot of this is again, right out of the fifties and sixties samurai films. And, uh, I know when I was watching it, uh, I can't remember. Someone said, why is everything moving? Like, why is the, his hair keep moving? Why is there always stuff blowing in the background? I'm like, you've got to go watch an Akira Kurosawa film, right? If you go watch one of those films, you see that there's stuff moving constantly and it does not stop moving. And that's just his style. So in addition to playing to, you know, fans of Star Wars, they were playing to fans of anime. They were playing to fans of uh, Akira Kurosawa and the 50s and 60s samurai films that came out, the black and white ones, especially. Right. Uh, there was just so many throwback callbacks to a lot of this stuff. Um, but I really liked his style, too, like the way they drew him. Like he looks pretty menacing. I'll see if I can go. Back. I'm just going to jump ahead here. Well, it's in my background, if you can see it there, where he's kind of walking through, you know, and and, and right. he's and there's that one point where he's just standing there. I mean, it looks like it's right out of like Samurai Showdown, the video game, if you've ever played that <laughs> too, where they're just kind of standing there looking menacing as as usual. But um, but um, what about the music? Because we haven't really talked about the music, and I want to make sure we touch on the music, at least in all of these episodes. But 
Did you did you get anything from this one in particular with the music or? Yeah, what stood the most out about this one is that these were like variations of Star Wars tunes that we know. Mm -hmm. So you hear it's almost like an upside down duel of the fates as they're fighting uh, with the with the Sith warrior or with uh, Ronan and the and the, the the lead bandit, and you just get some of those themes. They're all they all feel like they're just a little different. They're just flipped upside down. Maybe the chords are you know, reversed or they're, instead of doing a fifth, they're doing a fourth, you know, and just these different types of uh, approaches to something that sounds really similar, but it's still very different. And of course, visually, they snuck in a couple little Easter eggs of like a, the poster from the initial, like the original Star Wars <laughs> yeah. poster. Yeah. And I'll see if I can like find that. it while you're talking here. Yeah. I think they actually did it twice. I think there was one in the, like the introduction area. And then when they're in the, when they're in the courtyard, when they're facing off, when Ronan and the, the bandit are facing off each other. Yeah, there was, um, I'm, I was hoping you were going to talk more, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, but the music, it, of course the sound effects, man, when he pulls his saber out, that growling, it was like the Kylo Ren sound when Kylo Ren ignites his saber, you just get this growl and you didn't necessarily get the, you know, the sparks and the sizzling, but it was just a very unique, even when he put it back into the sheath. Mm -hmm. And so if people don't know the really cool thing about his lightsaber is that it is always activated. It is never deactivated and it, it's stuck. It's a, it's a flaw in the system that, or the flaw in the design that he never bothered to fix. And even in the book, they, they, they explain it a little bit, but then they kind of drop it. No, careful. But, you can't be talking about it. I know, but it, so, <laughs> right. you got more, two more days, but no, that's oh, minor. Gosh, I'm sure yeah. it's minor. It's minor. It's minor. Right. Yeah. But anyway, so it's a, it, it yeah, it, it's kind of a neat idea though. And that's why you see it extended all the time. Yeah. And yeah. And so, but you just get these really cool sound effects. I love uh, what well, we're going to call him Forlom. These characters aren't named, of course, in this episode. But Forlom with the Gatlin gun, that he's you know he's the rail gun that he's holding, and it's just this wonderful sound that you get with it. Of course, the, the colors are all perfect. You are not going to find this thing, man. Um, yeah, I'm telling you. Like, well, it's <laughs> like I'm I'm scared to play anything because I don't want to get struck struck for a copyright. Uh, yeah. we'll just leave it right here. Since yeah, this it's is coming a, right. Yeah, it's coming after this scene here. Yeah. Um. Yeah, this is I was my gonna, favorite scene, the, the helicopter yeah, that's scene. It's a crowd favorite. I was going to say about the music. Um, there's Forlom right there. He's that RA7 droid. Uh, the one thing about the music, so there were, like you said, there were moments in there. So uh, whenever the um, the Sith appeared, it was, uh, and you correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't that the Cloud Riders music from like Infus Nest and all them? That It's kind of like, a, I wouldn't say it's somebody's chanting, but they're kind of just singing like these chords. Yeah, it was you know really what I'm similar. Saying? Yeah, there, yeah, there's so many similar things. You you think you're hearing one part of the soundtrack, but you're you're really not. I think this is all original music, but it's all like you were saying before. It's heavily inspired by everything yes. that we know, especially from the original trilogy. Yeah. Yep. There's uh, and then later on when they're dueling on the log, that is like eerily sounding to or very similar to um, Revenge of the Sith when Anakin and Obi Wan are fighting. Uh, on yeah. Mustafar with like, just shades with of that of the, there. yeah with Duel of the Fates mixed in there too mm -hmm. it's this yeah. really cool blend of, of how they made that work yep um, I did really like these guards like the, again there's a, I don't know if there's a whole storyline in the book or not on these guys but just the fact that you have that that protocol droid that with the heavy repeater um, there's that that stormtrooper that's in the tower uh, he, he looked like a cloud rider in terms of like the furs and all of that that he had on there uh, we talked about, well, we haven't really mentioned it, but the Trandoshan, who, and when you you and I have both read this over the weekend, and I and neither one of us could remember where we saw this, but this is supposed to be Bosk. Um, but what's weird is in the credits of this, it just says Trandoshan. Yeah, I know. However, the person, <laughs> that, the person that said it was, like, credible. You know what I mean? Like, I remember right. reading it and going, oh, I didn't know. I, I believe this person um, because they're related or working at Lucasfilm or whatever, but... Um, I'm not going to find this stuff. I really want to hit play, but there's so much. There we go. Yeah. Like, this is so cool. I mean, the Doug, and he's got that hat on, riding around, that little protocol, or the uh, uh, Imperial probe droid was great. Um, well, there was they, a Gron in there. Yeah, the, the sparks, when they're firing, they're hitting the armor, especially the one trooper, the one uh, guard, the town guard who gets just lit up and it just get all these, like, orange sparks on him. It's just fantastic. The, the way mm. the animation was perfectly synced with it and just really got a really cool view of it. But this whole style in general, the only color, I mean, you have color just in splashes here and there, and it just draws your attention to whatever's going on. But there's so many other cool details going in the background. If you pause and take a look at it and it's just the, the detail in like, in this one, you have the, 
you know, the ropes and stuff on top of the of the walker. And there's just a lot there all the time. Like I said, everything's always moving. So there's always something interesting to kind of go see what they've done. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of pulls your eye in. Um, Chef Chris said that uh, his five-year-old son said this was the uh, Mary Poppins with the lightsaber. Yeah. That's so, pretty accurate. Yeah. Well, that's pretty accurate. Yeah. So now that Mike's gone, uh, let's, let's <laughs> talk he, about. He fired me a second time for those, <laughs> yeah. for those listening. Oh, did he? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this was, a, a, you know, lightsaber flying. You know, the only time we'd ever seen this really is in um, Star Wars Rebels. Right. And uh, we don't need to understand the physics of it all, but it, it definitely seemed like it was a callback to that. But her this weapon was pretty brutal. And the way she killed Bosk or the Trandoshan was pretty brutal as well, because not only did she impale him, but it's only like halfway through his body. And then she opens up this umbrella, which means this guy was cut into like whatever the math is, eight pieces, nine pieces as well. Now, they don't show all of that, but it's they're pretty clean cuts at that it point. Brutal. But yeah, it was pretty brutal. So, um, you know, so in the whole there's so much stuff in here that's just like, you know, umbrellas and the hats that they wear. This is all very much like feudal Japan looking stuff. What did you think about the Sith and her look? I'm gonna, I don't know. I'm calling her stiletto Sith or Sith <laughs> stiletto because she's got stilettos on. I mean, she's stiletto standing, bandit. Yeah, when she <laughs> uh, when she comes out and she you gonna you kind of get that very first shot of her. It's from the kind of from a lower at the ground. You're actually looking at her little stiletto shoes or heels that she's got on. But um, her mask was kind of yeah. creepy, and it reminded me of Abolith. Oh, Abeloth. Abeloth, not Abeloth. Yeah. Abeloth, yeah. Another, you remember another that? crowd favorite. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's so again, Rondo's gone, so we don't need to worry about it. But right. yeah, uh, you for, know, the heels, the heels, of course, not very functional. So I don't, I don't. Well, quite she seemed to be doing just fine. Yeah, I, I don't understand the why they went that way. I guess I, I don't know if there's some reasoning behind that. But overall, I think her style was really cool. I like the menacing face. You know, it's just all the teeth, and you could just see her eyes. Yeah, there's Boss getting split into. Yeah, eight pieces. like a pizza pie. Yeah, and then for what's funny is that Forlom, he's like, no, you know, he gets all upset because he's got feelings. <laughs> so they're all buddies. They are. But yeah. It was just interesting when I first saw this. I was like, man, are these guys all bounty hunters? Or are they really just the town guard? And it seems like they're just the town guard. They're the town guards. Is yeah, what this, is, all, yeah. this is where you're going to see the, um, the Star Wars art in the background right after this. We're never going to find that. Right. But anyway, her look, yeah, she's got this like diamond on the, on her forehead and she's got this mask and actually what's in there. It is right there. You just saw it. Did I? Yep. There it is. Top left. Yeah. Yeah. But she's got this mask. And actually when it gets cut off later, it's almost like this leather buckled on thing. It, it's not like a cloth. It's actually like a, a leather something or another when, when Ronan you know, trims it off of her. But the whole, the whole outfit is very interesting though, because it's got this like scaled, I'm assuming leather type of top to it mm -hmm. uh, and these very kind of baggy, you know, very traditional type of uh, leggings. Same with Ronan. Ronan's got a very you know, traditional uh, outfit here and a lot of his mannerisms and things are very you know, traditional is what he's doing. But it, I, th I thought the design of this was really cool. Her hair is nuts though. I don't know how I feel about the hair. It's like Cruella DeVille on steroids. <laughs> this white and black thing is just, it's crazy. But yeah, I was going to make, I was going to try to find that. This is this is this is not really good for interactive TV because um, the little thumbnail that pops up is not when you click it. That's oh, not the shot that it's showing. So yeah, that's awful. Trying to you had to try to take in our visuals for the episode art. It's yeah. a it's not fun. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, you get look at this like the orange and yellows. It's just mm -hmm. and it's always popping out at you, and then you get really cool things. So you get the. The umbrella, you know, and then she actually pulls a lightsaber out of it. So it's actually putting the blade in it and then it mm -hmm. disperses the, the like the, the kyber through, you know, each of the, what are they, I don't know what those are called on an umbrella. What are the little spikes arms. called? Arms. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. So it, it, it's all built through a lightsaber, right? And then you've got mm -hmm. Ronan and he catches her lightsaber like we saw in the trailer, which is just freaking phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, but what's interesting though is that they, they jump straight to that he's a Jedi. Right. And that they don't have any inclination that he's a Sith because why would he be going up against one of his own otherwise? Yeah. Yeah. And he's not, I mean, he's not, he's neither Jedi nor Sith. He's, he's right. supposed to be a Ronin. Um, and I, that whole line of where he says, unfortunately, I'm not a Jedi. I was really, I it's an like interesting this part line. Of, yeah. Well, yeah, we've heard it before in star Wars. I was hoping they would just give it like, do it. I'm no Jedi. I wish he, I wish he would have just said that. Cause that would have been like a, 
it's such an, I mean, I know it's kind of on the nose and a slap on her face and then that sort of thing. But I mean, if you're going to pay a tribute, I mean, if this is a love letter, just go, go, go all in and gush over the love letter. Right. And just say, I am no Jedi, but nonetheless, it was fine. I mean, it was great that he at least said but it. it so it's he, just interesting with, unfortunately I'm not. And it, it's just really interesting, uh, comment of, of, you know, for someone who was a Sith, but he's clearly not a Jedi, mm -hmm. but. You know, so does he want to be a Jedi? And, and some things like that. We're hoping the books will will clarify some of that for us as we get through them. Yeah, my man, look at that. Riss Bayless. What's up? Anyone see the Goto <laughs> Albert? <laughs> oh, that's a uh, that's a, a, a bad batch reference, inside joke. If you've been watching or listening to the shows. No, there were no Gotas. Like that's a, such a disappointment. We'll get to that. That's actually but gonna you be did get a, a gonk droid that has a T did on his head. And he moves really fast for a gonk droid. I've never seen a gonk droid move at the speed that he does. Oh, look, I even have my little gonk droid out there. Um, yeah, this 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 is all great. Like, I really, even like uh, this R2 unit, um, his look is is phenomenal. I didn't, so, and this was, you know, this is not, again, not feedback because it's just part of storytelling. But a lot of, I've seen people go, why did he put out the uh, tea kettle? Like, that seemed kind of corny and... You know, it didn't make any sense. And how would he have known that, you know, when that thing went off, this RG unit was going to be repaired? And all that. and if you've watched a lot of these movies, even like if you go back to a lot of this, a lot of the old samurai films, a lot of the old uh, kung fu films that came out that were just exploding in the 60s and 70s, this is all kind of what they would do. They would say by the time something happens right. and this, you know, you need to do this or be ready when this thing goes off or whatever. It's, it's very similar. So. It's just, a, I guess it's a trope, if you want to call it that, or a cliche from the time in that era that they did it. And so that's why it worked. It, that's why it was worked in here. I saw this kind of like even um, kind of a callback to Luke when he's on the skiff, right, in Return of the Jedi and telling R2 to get ready. It was kind of similar to that in, in some, some regard, in some respect. So, yeah, I mean, we've seen this in Star Wars as a number. I mean, we see this in TV and movies in general, though, right? Mm -hmm. There's always some, you know, give me five minutes type of thing. So it's not unique to this i thought this was actually an interesting way of doing it and you can hear the kettle call right yeah now granted how did he know all that i get that yeah. question but at the same time i thought it was just neat and it was a different way of doing it yep so she dispatches all of these droids pretty quickly and there, i mean again this is not a very deep episode i mean there's a village uh boy the guards come in the sith takes him out and then it really just kind of ends up being a duel between Ronan and the Sith, um, you know, fighting on logs and all of that stuff was all very, that's again, right out of like old samurai movies, samurai showdown type stuff. I thought the battle was great. Like there was some it really was. good choreography. It wasn't uh, a lot of times when you start getting into animation and you're trying to animate lightsaber battles or just sword battles in general or combat, real close combat quarter type fighting. It becomes kind of hard to see, you know what I mean? Like sometimes it gets so, there's so much going on that, it, it's that fine line between show, you know, making you feel like, wow, there's, this is pretty intense. It's high powered. And at the same time, not making you feel like what the heck's going on. I can't even make sense of who's doing what I think they did a really good job, even with working in just a, you know, black and white with color. Maybe it was the color that made it pop, but uh, I thought they did a pretty good job with the choreography and it was pretty easy to follow. And yet it was still very exciting. Um, it had a lot of, again, a lot of throwbacks, a lot of good traditional type samurai combat type stances and moves and, all that with the whole logs and rolling down there off the the water and, you know, into the Shinto temple or whatever temple that was. It's all good stuff. But what did you think about the the combat itself? I thought it was fantastic. And actually, when she enters the waterfall and she spins her lightsaber, mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite moments of this episode just because you can actually see the detail of her spinning it around her hand. It, it's really, really cool. And it was just, it was great. Now, the, all the choreography on this whole episode was really, really fantastic. There was a lot of really fast moving things and they're all in these very shaded black and white, you know, sometimes a bit dark. And, but the, the way that they use the color really helps you draw your eyes to the things that you need to see. And uh, I, I think the, uh, like in particular, like the, the blue, the blue bracelet when he pushes the button, mm -hmm. you know, that, that was a huge one too, because you, you just yeah. don't know what he's doing. And then all of a sudden it's, it lights up. Right. And those types of things are just so important to get that, that visual and help you understand what just happened. But overall, I mean, just every part of this episode just had so many cool things going on to it. And we've got the, the whistling bird type of effect here <laughs> yeah, on screen. Say whistling birds. Yep. Yeah. So that was fantastic. And those things have some range apparently, because they came after. Oh yeah. Both her Way and down the, 
yeah, the guard on the side of the mountain. And it's funny because when we talked about whistling birds back in, um, I think it was when we were talking about one of the Mando shows. Um, I think we mentioned if, if we didn't do it on air, it might've been off air, but we were talking about how some of that was drawn from inspiration of like old, uh, Robotech movie or anime yeah. where the, you know, they would open up and they've got all these missiles and they would all yeah. launch and they kind of like Shoulders, do this whole yeah. stream. Yeah, exactly. And this is exactly what's happening here. Uh, one of the funnier posts I saw was somebody had posted a picture of that droid and said, this is a, the animated example of F around and find out kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> because he's so, you know, he just, he's, doesn't look menacing at all. Right. He's very unassuming. And yet he's got a, a rack of missiles in him that are heat seeking missiles that just kill just about everybody. So uh, hopefully we'll get to see more of that droid in the book when the, when that comes out. All right. Um, you you had an interesting question here though, with the yeah. temple. Yeah. I was kind of get, trying to fast forward over to it. Yeah. So in the temple, when you know she parts the, she, she puts the log in and divides the water there and she steps through it. She sees the lightsaber lit and she slashes through it. The face you believed looked like who? Right. There. The father. Yeah. From Mort from the Mortis trilogy. Right. And I didn't get that at all. Actually. Did you? Yeah. No, this is, so we have it on screen, but I just don't, maybe I have the way that he was drawn in clone wars is Maybe there's similarities here. I'm not drawing that connection to, but just didn't. I was going to, I'll do a comparison, um, maybe on Twitter or something. Uh, when, when I'm trying to get to the picture of it on the ground, cause that one, that's where you can see the crown. Not so much when he's just standing there. You go that one. See how he's got that crown. Yeah. So the crown looked the same. The beard looked the same beyond that. There's probably not much else, but I don't know. I mean, we'll crown side by side. Yeah. Yeah. I'll throw it up. It, and that's probably a stretch. It's probably me wishing uh, that, that this was a callback to, to the Mortis trilogy. But you yeah, that's what I saw in, whenever. You got to slip in a Mortis question about every five episodes anyway, yeah. just to keep <laughs> yeah. us on our toes. Right. To, to meet our quota of some sort. Um, right, let's, let's, let's move on to the very end here. Because, um, I mean, there's obviously a lot going on here. When he opens up his, um, his gi and he's got a whole, a lot of red kyber crystals. So he's yeah. been going around killing a lot of Jedi, presumably. Or people with at least Sith lightsaber. I'm sorry, he's been going around killing a lot of Sith. There we go. Or presumably people with uh, Sith uh, lightsabers. And uh, my my assumption is uh, we're going to get a lot of that backstory in the book. At least that's my hope right. that we'll find out what's kind of going on there. Um, yeah, you kind of wonder it was, if it's an atonement type of thing or, or what his what his vendetta is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He seems to be targeting exclusively um, the Sith. Now, if we go by like traditional Ronin. They were, uh, a lot of time they were samurai who were uh, either exiled or um, they had dishonored, you know, their emperor or their leader. And so they left and they decided they weren't going to pledge allegiance to any one emperor anymore because they disagreed with what they were doing or, you know, the family was killed. I mean, you throw in a whole, all these different tropes. And so they just kind of wandered around, uh, you know, the feudal areas and um, looking for, they'd make money doing duels or being, you know, the higher for different things. And that was just kind of thing. So they didn't pledge allegiance to any one emperor. Uh, but some of them did have vendettas. Some of them were going after people that, um, you know, if there was an emperor that, again, that they had left and wanted to take down, they were, you know, very stealthily, silently going around, maybe not so much silently, but going around killing a lot of, you know, his upper guards or other samurai and collecting scalps or swords or whatever tokens that they wanted to have. And I, I think that's probably where they're going with this, but uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll find out when the book comes out. But and nonetheless, it was a really cool thing. And uh, the fact that he cut open that kyber crystal and gave it to him, I just wondered, like, what was it that warded? Like, he says it wards off evil. Yeah, and I don't know I if don't that understand. was a. Yeah. Is that a literal thing, or is that just kind of symbolically it does that or not? I, I wasn't really sure. Yeah, I didn't know if it was to give the the because the chief is a child, right? Because mm -hmm. it looks like his father is either sick or dead uh, when they they showed it a little earlier in the episode. But yeah, I don't know if it's to inspire hope for them or or what. Yeah, because I've never heard of a kyber crystal warding off evil in any kind of way. So that, that yeah, was and a, it could just very, be uh, very weird. Yeah, very different. Yeah, I mean, it could just be, um, uh, you know, they're they're taking liberties with the the storyline and whether kyber crystals do or do not. It doesn't really, you know, they don't do it in in Star Wars that we know, but in this alternate reality kind of Star Wars, and yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah, and when we get into the book, well. We'll revisit some of this a bit here. Absolutely. There's uh, one thing I forgot to mention too, like throughout this episode, they put these, you can see it. I don't know if you can really see the detail. You see that little hairline thing yeah. that's going on there? Yeah. That whole aging, making it look like 
you know, it was on a film reel of some sort was really cool. And it was awesome throughout. I mean, yeah, the, the scratches and the film grain and everything mm-hmm. else. Yeah. It was great. Yep. So good stuff. But yeah, overall, I mean, and the story ends obviously with them kind of just wandering off and, you know, going on to their next village and whatever the next job is. Um, and we have no idea what that is until we get to the book. So, you know, when they talked about Ronin will be out, um, the novel will be out October 12th. Right. And, uh, they said that there was still a lot of storyline that had to be told. And yeah, it definitely was. I think we already called out two other ones. I think we felt the same way about, but, um, there was enough in this that's going to make me read the. Well, I have the book. I need to read it anyways, because we're supposed to, because they're giving us these books. (laughs) Um, but, uh, even if I hadn't got it, this was enough for me to feel like, okay, I'd go out and buy this book just to kind of understand what came before or what's coming after or what's going to, well, in this case, it's going to be what's coming after. Um, Cause there's a lot here. I mean, there, there was a lot to unpack, even though we didn't really get a lot of specifics, you know what I'm saying? If that makes any sense. Yeah. And you can see the book above my head here and it is a fan, it is a beautiful cover and it's a very got texture and stuff. So I highly recommend go out and checking out this book. It's got beautiful art on the inside too. That's very mm-hmm. reminiscent of what you got here. It's really cool looking. It's yep. definitely a nice piece to add to your collection. If you're into books. Uh, I got, I think I have mine in the mailbox. I have been busy this weekend. I have not even checked the mail, but I Man, saw I that got there mine was a, before yours. I know, right? It never usually happens. Get, I usually get mine before you, but, but okay. But yeah. So I think the one negative about this episode was that there wasn't a lot of story in the story in the episode. I think that was the thing that was a bit, I don't know, disappointing in a certain way. Cause it, mm-hmm. it, the thing is with the book, this is about the 30, first 35 pages, I believe they've said somewhere in there. So those first two, three chapters. Uh, but there's really not a lot of story here because there's not a lot of dialogue. It's really mm-hmm. all the dialogue is very ancillary and very unimportant for the most part. And so I was disappointed that they didn't do enough there to really get you excited for the book. I think they could have done more to be excited about the book rather than saying, oh, this is really cool to look at. Now I want to read it. Yeah. Because this in the in the book have, you know, the, there's, they go in a very different direction. So it's just, a, it's it was interesting they didn't do more of that in it. But visually, this is really I mean, visually, this has got to be one of the top uh, episodes that they've released out of all of these. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. And I think for anybody that joined us a little bit late tonight, uh, both Jonesy and I, I think, had this. Oh, no, you didn't have this one in your top three. No, but, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I did. Because I did. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's, um, we'll talk about, let's get into the second one here. Yeah. Um, Tatooine Rhapsody. <laughs> so, okay. So give me your overall kind of thoughts on this one, because I know um what did you like about it the most i mean it, again i didn't hate it but it certainly wasn't one of my favorites I, I, admittedly i love the rock track man i really do and okay. I, yeah. i've been on record with the you know with solo and stuff and when they did the trailer you know they, they had the, the the guitar and stuff like that it was really exciting hoping that they would do something different and this is about as close as we've got to that right it's just this very different soundtrack to it you get a very mm-hmm. serious beginning but then you get right into this you know heavy riff and and, and things like that and they're a rock band and but it's still what was really weird about it was that it was still very Star Warsy in a certain way. It was a very mm-hmm. different type of Star Wars, make no mistake. It was very familiar. It really was. I mean, and, yeah. I mean, some of that was the the language they were using or the wording, but at the same time, it was still a blend of, yeah, a, a regular old band like you'd have anywhere else here in real life. And then you also have this, you know, they're getting hunted for, mm-hmm. for whatever reason. We still don't really quite understand all the way, but. But I just like the I just like the vibe, man. It was just very, it was just a, I don't want to say upbeat, but like it was very energetic. It just had yeah. a lot of energy behind it, and and I thought the story itself was actually pretty solid. I thought it was really not bad at all. I thought it was it was a it was interesting enough to where it, it kept you moving. This is one of the ones I was thought I'd laughed the hardest at, and, and one be, be, be one of my <laughs> lowest ones actually going into this. I was like, this is going to yeah. be more up your alley than mine. But at the end of well, the day, while plot it was, twist, it was yeah, while it was very campy at times make no mistake yeah i thought it was just really good because it was just so different and it really i love rock music so like actual rock music not journey and so it, <laughs> oh, wow shots fired shots, shots fired. fired shots yeah. fired but yeah. um so what about you what what fell short was it the same things that fell short for you or is it something else i don't so, so, okay so i this one was very unique if, if like of all of the ones that i saw this was a very anime and i'm i hate to say anime looking but it oh, felt yeah. like um it, it was a, very a style that you visually that you picture in your head when you think of anime yeah no and it was um and i know people are gonna put me on a cross for this but it was very like pokemon style kind of animation you know what i mean like where yeah. 
the faces would stop and sometimes people wouldn't move and the expressions with their eyes would go white. And I get it. That's all. I get the style. I understand the style. But that's the part of the when I said there's certain anime that I just never really kind of resonated with me. That's it. And so Fair enough. so it was, it was already kind of coming in, I guess, uh, maybe on a, a strike uh, against it, a strike against it. Yeah. But I will say this. So I actually enjoyed I'm with you. I enjoyed the rock music in this and all everything except for the last track. Yeah. And I don't know what the heck happened because I've heard Joseph Gordon Levitt, who plays Jay. I've heard him sing before. So I don't know if they said, look, go out there and sing off key. And hit, try to hit notes that you normally can't hit. Or did they say, uh, just go ahead and sing it however you want to sing it? And he just did it. But like it was flat. It, like he was voice was flat. The notes weren't uh, right. And I just wasn't sure if that was, you know, a limitation of what Levitt can do. Because, I've again, I, I think he can carry a note. I've heard him sing. Or was it he was just doing that on purpose because Jay really wasn't supposed to be a good singer. And that's that was kind of throwing me off. Um, the music was cool. Um, the last number didn't feel as... Like it was, I don't know, felt a little repetitive, but yeah. again, it, this, this is not why we watched this episode. It wasn't, it wasn't like we went in going, oh, I'm, I'm expecting really great music. I think we got really good music, but I don't think we, no one should have went in expecting this to be really great music. Um, uh, so that, so those were some of the, the kind of strikes. We had a pretty good cast. I mean, there was, yeah. uh, like I said, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Bobby Moynihan, who's, you know. Star of this episode, man. Well, he's been in so many stars. I mean, he was in uh, Resistance, and um, I think he played. He was on one of the Stormtroopers. He did something in Rise of uh, Skywalker. I can't remember what it was now, but he's been he's been doing Star Wars stuff for quite some time. Um, we had Mark Thompson, who we all know and love, is playing a lot now. Mark Thompson did, I think, a voice in every one of these at some point. So, as you would expect him to, oh, he was super excited. He tweeted on Twitter that. This was the the one time, the, the one thing seeing his name in blue meant the most to him. So it was mm -hmm. very emotional seeing his name on screen for something, which is pretty neat. Yeah, no, no absolutely. And then, of course, we had Tamara Morrison playing Boba yeah. Fett, Boba which, Fett. you know, they, they were certainly capitalizing, uh, maybe not intentionally, but they are they are definitely going to ride the wave of Book of Boba and coming off of season two of The Mandalorian. So. I actually thought Boba was well-written, though, in this episode. I, yeah. thought, I thought the the dialogue that he had was actually pretty solid. No, I do, too. Um, and the sound effects they had for uh, fire spray, I guess we have to start calling it now. Is that what they call it? Slave one? We'll I don't know. They one. haven't officially. So until Boba Fett says this is I'm now calling the ship fire, the fire spray, then it's slave one for me. So until then. Fair enough. Uh, but they got the sound effects and the visuals like coming right at you, like from Attack of the Clones was mm -hmm. spot on. It was fantastic. Fire! Yeah, that's what it reminded me of. That Get him, scene. Dad. Get him, Dad. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, going back to the music, uh, I mean, they took a page right out of the Cantina cast, uh, which I thought was kind of cool. I mean, we yeah. kind of come in with this little rocking tune that we do. Yeah, we're waiting um, for the, uh, for the, uh, checks to come in. What's it called? What, for royalties. Yeah. Royalties. Yeah. Well, we're not getting those. But what is, so am I wrong, honestly? And I want you to be fair. Uh, was I wrong about the vocals there with Levitt at the end? Uh, no, at the beginning they were off key as well. And I think some of that was, I wonder if that was by design. Cause when you go to a club and you listen to a band, like how often do you hear them right on key? Practically never, even the, even the famous people don't hit the notes all the time. And when you get a live album, they've, they've corrected a lot of that stuff in post. So to be fair, I think some of it was probably intentional because I can't imagine they would allow him to be wrong unless it wasn't on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, as far as the synopsis goes, because I know we've, before we get into a little bit uh, <laughs> more here. Uh, so set after the fall of the Republic, a young Padawan by the name of Jay befriends a hut. And starts a band. <laughs> that seems pretty innocuous. Yeah. Uh, this hut is wanted by Jabba, then is captured by Boba Fett and taken to Mos Espa to be executed. But Jay bargains with Jabba to allow their band to play one final gig. And this is every band's dream, right? Like this is like right out of uh, what was it, uh, School of Rock? You know, where right. they they were just they wanted to have he wanted to have Dewey or whatever his name was wanted to have just one good show, and that, maybe that's just what all bands aspire to is just to have that one show that. You know, everything went right and the crowd was in it and you just felt like a rock star. And uh, so that was the storyline. Again, it doesn't. It, well, that was really it, everything that happened in the story. <laughs> it is. But like I said, it felt very familiar. Like we had, we were on Tatooine. Uh, we had Padawans. We got to see lightsabers. We had Boba Fett. We had Jabba. We had Bib Fortuna. Um, I mean, it was all like, and, and this could have been, I mean, I don't know, but it could, it was of all of them. This is one of them that you could just throw in there and say, oh yeah, that was canon. Now it changes our perspective on 
Jabba and maybe even Boba Fett because at the end he was finally getting into it. Uh, by the way, the little hammerhead that was dancing at the very beginning was the cutest thing in the world. Like I need to, I'm going to try to make that a little, little jiffy uh, for me. But this is one that I felt like, yeah, you could throw this in there and say it's canon. You could. I mean, there wasn't it. anything that wasn't not right. Right. Yeah. And there were a couple little fun things too, like his microphone when he turned it on was a lightsaber sound. You know. <laughs> yeah, and right. Then, yeah. And then the uh, the gig van, the the band's van, or the yeah, the band's van. Yeah. Of course, had star. It was a star waiver. It was star waiver. Well, that was the name of the band. Yeah. Star waiver. Right. But they, they had it. So it was like, it was the, the star Wars equivalent of the van, you know, for the band that they tried to travel to every gig in. It was just, it, when, when you make those, those connections, it just makes you laugh. And you're like, this is, this is wonderful. I love this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, so Chris was saying it sounds better in Japanese to me. Maybe it had something to do with that. I, I would, I, that's the one I know you disagreed, but I actually enjoyed the, Japanese vocals and the Japanese uh, voices in this one more than the American, but yeah, whatever. Each his own. Yeah, Gee was um, the real star of this show, man. Bobby Moynihan, who was Gel Gee or yeah. Gee? Sorry, yeah, no, yeah. Bobby Moynihan's the voice on this character was just absolutely perfect. Yeah, it was good. This was the cleanest one too. Like there was, I mean, look, I mean, the artwork is the style is beautiful. The colors are yeah. beautiful. Um, even the shading and all that was just phenomenal stuff. So. It was really good stuff. I mean, visually, it was uh, a lot, a lot of fun to watch. Um, was not expecting Boba Fett. Um, I have, and, you know, when we were breaking these down from the trailer, I can't remember if we had called that this was that Boba Fett was in this one. Do you remember that? If we said that, or did we put him in a different one and screwed that up? Do you remember I that? I don't know that we got that specific. To be actually, be honest with you. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna give us an out on that one. Yeah. No, I appreciate that because you know, <laughs> anytime we can not look stupid, let's do it. Yeah. Well. Um, we got a Wilhelm scream in this one. We did. So, I mean, it was like, again, this is a, just a freaking love letter. It's like, oh, what do I know about Star Wars? Oh, I love the fact that they've always put Wilhelm scream. Let's get it in this episode. <laughs> Certainly threw one in there about it. And now I have to um, use a hut with hair and a nose ring <laughs> and glasses. Okay. So let's, let's try to like, all right. So I'm going to ask you a question. Let's try to get like serious about this episode. Why would Jabba, like what threw me off was you had Jabba the hut, a hut. And he was wanting this hut, Geezer, to go be part of their hut family. But the punishment for not doing that was he was going to just kill him. And I don't, like, I, I mean, I, granted, I don't know everything about huts and their society and all that. But that was kind of weird for me that they would do yeah. that. Yeah, well, but again, when you cross the family. We, did they seen... say why he crossed? No, no. legitimately. Do you, I don't remember if they did. Okay. No, they, yeah, they didn't. They didn't. Because Boba said, you know why, but we don't really ever get an exact reason why. But yeah, it definitely sounds like he doesn't want part of the family business or whatever. So I, I wrote in the show notes, I was like, is this is this Stinky's brother, his older brother? Is this his crazy <laughs> uncle or what? If you remember from the Clone Wars uh, oh, animated movie. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. But uh, yeah, something he did across Jabba. And not like it takes a whole lot to cross Jabba. I mean, we we saw this in the, in the Clone Wars movie as well. Uh, mm -hmm. What was his... Uh, uh, what was his other? He always gets pissed off by his family, though. To be honest with you, but, yeah. I'm trying to think of. It wasn't zero, but it was the. Um, oh yeah, it was zero. Was this okay? Yeah, fine. It was zero. No, there was another yeah. one too. But well, yeah, I think another, you're. Yeah, you were one. talking about zero though. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. But those, I like those huts. Those Jabba huts get around. Gi was short for geezer, though. Yes. So oh, okay, yeah. So that makes sense. Go geezer Butler from Black Sabbath, bass player. Fantastic. Really? I didn't put that together. I wonder if that was uh, intentional. Nice yeah, call yeah, there. That'd be interesting if it was for Japanese. I mean, maybe Black Sabbath is huge, huge in Japan. They are. I mean, who doesn't like Black Sabbath? I'm I'm like 5'8", and I'm pretty huge in Japan. Just kidding. Wow. That was absolutely That's a Bill bizarre. Murray joke. It's not mine. I, would, I can't God. take credit for it. It was a Bill Murray yeah. joke. That's just, oh, let me write it down. Another apology episode we got to do. Yeah, that'll, that'll hit us later. Uh, okay. So going back to, um, again, some of the stuff that was familiar, we got a line of, I have a bad feeling about this in, in this as well. So just to point that out, um, there was a, punch you it. know, well, there was, yeah, punch. It was in this one. It was, I already punched it. That was great. <laughs> there was a V5, the little droid, you know, when he's playing back the very first time that they got together as a band was kind of right. like the rise of Skywalker where no last Jedi. Sorry. Last Jedi, where uh, R2-D2 had played back the the message from Princess Leia to kind of get right. him to come back. So kind of a similar thing there. 
Um, that whole pot, that whole scene where it's kind of wrapping around um, the Buntha. Uh, yeah, that, that sweeping. On Espa. Yeah, the sweeping shot of uh, of the track around the was arena. That, was was that like 100% lifted right out of the, I remember that, that scene in episode one almost exact, but uh, I, I never got a chance to go back and just kind of put those two side by side to see if it really was that way. Yeah, it, it's pretty close otherwise, but I mean, yeah, it, yeah, it looks way better than Phantom Menace. Which, by the way, was practical effects. Right, yeah. Um, a lot of people think it was CGI and it was Oh, not. yeah, they actually had little people in stands and stuff for mm-hmm. it. Yeah. I mean, um, it was just beautiful, though. I mean, it, this episode in general, the, the colors and the you know, a lot of it was, it was really high quality on this. Okay, so here's another question for you getting into the lore and, and seriously getting and trying to get into the, the heads of what's going on here, taking it as though it were a canonized episode. Um, what, what did uh, what did they bargain Jabba? Because he comes back and says, we made a deal with Jabba and they're going to let us play this one last final kind of uh, gig. But was it just, hey, was it just that? Or do you think they gave him something or told him like, oh, we'll give you 90% of our record sales? I have no idea because they have nothing to sell. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So they bar- I don't know what they bargained. And then they had the nerve to say that they would let him be their first sponsor. Mm-hmm. Job would be like, no. Yeah. Just going to do what I want you to do. Yeah. You are now part of my, my cantina band. Uh, any so, chance this could be Jabba's son or something along those lines? Uh, it doesn't seem like Jabba's son is because we, we know that Stinky or Rhoda was in the Clone Wars era. And this is not terribly long after that. And he seemed pretty attached to Rhoda. Well, unless unless Gee was a disappointment, and so he's trying to trying it over again with Stinky. <laughs> I'm gonna go with Crazy Uncle. Crazy Uncle for yeah. hundred dollars. Yep. For oh, Jabba being the Crazy Uncle. No, 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 no. Gee, Gee's gonna be Rhoda's Crazy Uncle. Oh, great. Go, Rhoda's Crazy Uncle. Gotcha. Yeah. One of yeah. Jabba's brothers. Brothers. Kids. Or... Such a disappointment for the family. Yeah. Half brother, sister kind of person. Yeah, that's where I'm gonna go. Hut drama. Um, There's always a lot to be thrown around okay What's and possible? Did, so what could have they have is I, there I, any I ideas know. for no. you what they could have bargained no maybe they gave up the van <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe it was the van i don't know the only what they thing of value they had kind of i mean a, a lucrative record deal or profits or royalties that's i mean i don't know what what they would have bargained for right we're losing viewers now um okay <laughs> so <laughs> when the music plays though and everybody's getting into it. I'll see if I can find this. There's no way I'm going to find it. But this is a horrible tool. Whose idea was this? Uh, there is a, they cut away. And do they not cut away to Ben Kenobi's hut? Yeah, it sure looks like it. Yeah, it looks like Kenobi's hut. Yeah. yeah. And so even even Kenobi's in there banging his head a little bit too. <laughs> he probably is. Uh, yeah. Just take most, our word for it. Civilized. Take our word for it. This tool sucks. But yeah, there's, um, I'm pretty sure that was Ben Kenobi's hut. So it was kind of cool. Yep. Um, Kenobi's house or whatever you want to call it. It was a very inspirational moment at the end. It was bringing, it was the spirit of unity. Oh, wow. Uh, Lena so would be proud. So there's a lot of like, I just top, off the top of my head, there's a lot of anime that have to do with like bands and rock music. Yeah. Um, I think of like, uh, uh, what was it? The, uh, even like the silver Hawks in the eighties. You know, they played musical instruments. Do the Japanese uh, love hard rock and heavy metal. It's awesome. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, one of my favorite bands is Loudness. And those are a bunch Very of good. guys from Japan that don't speak hardly any English, but still rock out and still sing uh, in English lyrics, which is awesome. So it's so. a lot like Ozzy. Don't understand anything he's saying <laughs> yeah, normally, yeah, he's but saying, yeah. <laughs> understand every word he has when he's singing it. Yeah. No, they do. They really do. Um, and please check out Loudness if you if you get a chance. Um. But yeah, this was, um, again, very similar. But, I mean, you had Jabba was all in at the very end. Again, we talked about Boba Fett. He was tapping away or he was nodding around like he was getting into it. And uh, I guess they sponsor him. I, like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, they, they, never, they didn't contract. subtitle it. So I couldn't tell what Jabba said or, or whatever. But those, the little skiff and everybody that was on it, you know, that we would see later on in Return of the Jedi all kind of took off. But uh, you know what we should totally do is we should go grab a scene from a new hope and then splice that audio, like the band playing in the background when Luke is inside his, uh, in his hut there. So that's the new. Oh, canon. Oh, so they oh, did make it. From a new hope. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you can hear playing it like on background. a radio back there in the background. Yeah. When he's doing his little thing. Yep. Who his remembers this oldie from about, you know, 
15 years ago. Right. It was a cute story. It was. It was entertaining. It was just entertaining. There was, it mean, was there very was, different. Yeah, it was just fun. I just thought it was fun. I don't Look, know what the lesson was in this. Like, you know, <laughs> friendship. Something oh, like that. But I don't know. Is Bo, I don't know how Bo was drinking this. He can't take his helmet off, can he? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. You should write a certain letter to somebody, Jonesy. I think you've called him out for it. I am. I'm very concerned about where this is leading us. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be one of those people, Albert. That's you. It is me. What the, uh, what was the, uh, the one that Mark Thompson played, the drummer? Um, yeah. Was that, I've never seen that race before. Have we? No, I don't think so. Made up, made for this kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, Very convenient because, you know, you could either be Neil Pert or you could be this thing that's got six arms and do the same kind of performance. Yeah. It was pretty neat. Reminded me of, a. Uh, how, what was that thing from the Transformers? Oh, the um, Quinticons. Yeah, the Quinticons. Yeah. No, oh, my faces. Okay, well, I don't know what else to say about this. It was cool. Oh. I, I, I wasn't my favorite, but I did appreciate the artwork. I liked the, the rock music. Uh, I would say it's probably the most, again, the one that you could probably just drop right into the timeline and say, yep, that happened, yeah. um, and not feel like you were really stretching the mythology. Uh, in any way, but and really, who doesn't want a flamethrower coming out of their guitar? I mean, seriously, <laughs> we all want this. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Are you ready to move on? Let's do it. Okay. Before last one. About, I'll start talking about Kiss and Ace Frehley shooting rockets out of his guitar and stuff. It's all right. Hey, he did. He did. Yeah. Uh, did you ever watch the uh, Kiss? Uh, what was it? The Carnival one from like the seventies? Was like circa seventy eight, seventy nine? That movie they made. Dude, yeah, it was awful. Oh, dude, I loved it. As a kid? I, of course you did. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. You could not make me stop watching that. And my cousin, um, I don't remember how he had a copy because this would have been like 78. And I don't think they had a VCR. I don't remember how he had it, but I remember going over there and being able to watch it. Maybe he had, a, he had to have VCR of some sort. And oddly enough, our viewers have ticked up. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, they're kind of like fluctuating. Yeah. We're getting some and dropping some immediately here. But um, I actually strapped a Roman candle into my guitar once. Did you really? That's a story for another day. Wow. All right. Episode three. <laughs> the twins. Okay. The, the twins. twins. All right. Give me your thoughts on this one. Kind of overall. Dude, what do you think? Yeah. Gemini class Star Destroyer is pretty, uh, pretty badass. Not going to lie. Mm -hmm. That's a. Uh, I like the concept for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Two, so maybe those haven't seen it. Two Star Destroyers linked with a. Death Star super weapon in the middle. If you think about the uh, Last Jedi, the, the thing that they were uh, miniaturized Death Star tech, I forgot what they called it exactly, but that's basically what's in between this and they want to go shoot things. What was really interesting though is the droid gave you like this entire exposition about everything, caught you up all right at once. It was great. Mm -hmm. I mean, completely unnecessary, but great anyway. So you at least knew what was happening. <laughs> yep. yeah. Gave you the idea of the, the, the body armor and then stuff for the twins and whatnot and yeah, but we're introduced to both Am and Kare, and um, clearly they uh, thought they were aligned, but not quite. Am's got pretty ambitious things, but this was a, actually, this was a disappointment to me, and I'm trying to put my finger on why. The problem is I've got multiple fingers, and I can put it in multiple places, and so the voice acting, I love, absolutely love uh, Neil, Patrick uh, Neil Patrick Harris, yeah. And his was okay. The dialogue, the, the the writing was a bit over the top, I think, in general. But some of the things were just really... And I know you were talking about Alison Brie. And no. Kind of hers. She broke my heart. Yeah. And, and so I don't know if I pinned it on the the actors so much, but it was very over the top. And again, some of it... Actually, Alison Brie, when when the when Anne was getting charged with the lightning and the overreaction, things like that, that was very... Like, actually, that's very true to, to form. You know, for this style, if you go back and watch all the any of the, the any of the you know, anime or even the, the cartoons that you and I grew up with that they poured it over here, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you get a lot of that stuff, right? So yes. it wasn't it was, that it was out of character and that it was over the top and all of that, but it was just, it was just, yeah, it just didn't, there was really not enough backstory. We got a lot of flashes of the, the twins born on the dark side. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about at the beginning of the show, there are some that we might come back to. I think this is one of those stories that clearly they left it with a story left to be had, but this is a story that there's a lot more to it that I think they could really flush out and they could really give us a lot more to it. And it would probably benefit this if, if they did, uh, because it would balance out some of the, 
just the, the visual nature of this episode and really give us a little bit more, a little more something to dig into. And, and they could really do something with that. I thought the, 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 the drawing style and then, and, and that, and the, the colors and all of that were really cool. I thought that was yeah, great. There was one yeah. coloration error I saw with the lightsabers. It was the only odd thing. They were orange for a moment in one, uh, in one, just oh, a few I think frames. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They were orange and then they flip back to red. So just, you know, color coding and that, but yeah, so it was a disappointment on the, the kind of the story and the really over the top you know, stuff. And, but again, this is, you know, these are the kind of the things you, you get sometimes where they're just kind of crazy and out there and they can be a lot of fun though. Yeah. I think, um, again, I think I mentioned earlier, but the visual, this was, this felt more like galaxy of heroes in terms of the style in which it was drawn. So it was, that was really appealing to me for me. It probably fell short again I, with you on the voice acting. Like I was really disappointed with Neil Patrick Harris and Alison and Brie. However, maybe it really was just the, like I didn't, and I didn't have a problem with the Japanese one. Right. Um, that seemed more like it was still over the top, but, uh, and to draw a comparison and it's, you're going to, I know again, people out there that if you, if you guys like anime, you guys are just cursing my name at this point. Cause I'm giving you these stupid references that everybody knows about, but like Akira, right? Uh, if you think about Akira visually, it's amazing, right? In terms of how they, how it was drawn, uh, the high frame rate, the, the frames per second in which it was drawn and animated is just astounding, especially when you consider this was, written, um, put out like in you know mid to late 80s um and when you watch the japanese version it is over the top but the but the animation or the uh the vote the voices the voice acting is so powerful that it seems to fit even though it is over the top the, the voice acting seems powerful when you get to the american version of akira it's like hard to watch like it's so over the top and so some of the stuff they say doesn't seem natural um it, it almost feels like the actor's are being forced to say something that they don't even really feel comfortable saying, but they know it's in the script. So they're just doing their best with it. And that's kind of how this one for me felt like it felt like they were saying and doing things that were almost either a tribute to that. Like you said, because there was a lot, a lot of our animation in the eighties was just like that. It was really bad uh, voice actors or very, very bad dubs or whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, because it really wasn't, you know, a lot of people that not, not a great, there wasn't a lot of voice actors out there. Um, and, uh, and not like today where there's, so, you've got, you know, the Mark Thompson's or, uh, right. what's his name from Cowboy Bebop and Zeb. Um, yeah, that guy, but anyways, you've got, you know what I'm saying? You've got a lot of really prominent voice actors now these days. So, uh, and, and maybe this isn't their forte. I don't know. I don't know that Alison well, Brie was Patrick anything. Patrick Harris has done lots of voiceover. He's been Spider-Man. No, no, he's been, yeah. 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 No, I'm not talking about him. I was going to say Alison Brie. The only thing I know she's been in was, uh, the Lego movie. And she was like uni, she was the unicorn. Oh, she was uni so, kitty. Yeah. Uni kitty. That. Yeah. That was Allison Brie. I mean, not that I saw her, but you know, right. that's, that was, she was in. Um, so yeah, I don't know if it was them or if it was a tribute to it, or they said, Oh, we want you to make this sound like the old eighties dubbed versions of anime. Cause that was really where it was at. But it was, um, it was like, oh, man, there was one scene though. Uh, Am goes, uh, you know, like they catch car and Kari, where were you going to take the, the power core? To a galaxy far, far away. Mm. I was just, it was, that was cringeworthy. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was just cringeworthy. I was like, wow, we really went there. Mm. We really went there. Okay. I kind of wanted to turn it off right then, to be honest with you. <laughs> you know like, what this did is not, This is not going to go the way I think it's going to go. This is something I would love to see in a graphic novel, though. Like, this story in graphic novel, I think oh, would be really, idea. really cool. Yeah. Yeah, same, same style, too. Yeah. Uh, what didn't stand out for me in this one was the music. Like, I can't even recall the music. And I don't know if it's just because right. there was so much going on, explosions and lightsabers and all of that stuff. It just kind of overpowered the music, but really the music were, was kind yeah. of played in the background there. Um, definitely didn't stand out. There weren't moments of it um, where it did. In the, in the beginning, it was good, though. It, uh, there were some in the beginning where you could hear it, and it was solid. It was kind of what you would expect. But again, yeah, it was just one of these things of you keep expecting the story to come out somewhere, but it's not. You don't know why Kari doesn't want uh, is trying to take the power core away he's not aligned with either the empire or the rebellion or republic or whoever you know, where this is actually at uh so it's really confusing about what he wants to do and it's just very very confusing mm -hmm. of course we get our, our catwalk with no uh safety rails. no rails yep there is no such thing as osha on on the empire um I, we didn't give a synopsis did you write one up for this oh no, I did not. But we, 
<laughs> so uh, we'll we'll give one real fast. So okay, go ahead. Am and Car, yeah. So they've got these Gemini class, the stu- two star destroyers. They have to both they have a Kyber crystal that powers it, but they have to channel it through their power armor and it dark armor, it. right? Their dark armor, right? And it will destroy a planet. And this is how they're going to bring peace and prosperity to the galaxy by blowing everything up. So uh, Kari has a change of heart for some reason, steals the power core, and then they proceed to fight over it. And at one point, they're both force, you know, grasping at the uh, at the crystal, and it shatters. And they both get a fragment of it. And Am gets a much larger fragment than uh, than Kari does. But, and this is where we see in the trailer where she puts it into her armor. But before all that happens, it's an interesting, this is actually one of the interesting things is that Kari pulls her into a force vision mm-hmm. and shares a voice, uh, a force vision with her, which I thought was really fascinating that that, that was a thing you could do. Uh, have we seen anything like that before? No, no, not that I'm aware. I mean, I'm not going to definitively say no, but I couldn't recall that ever happening. Right. So he's, he's trying to show her like, this is what you're going to become if, if we keep going down this path. And she's like, screw it. I don't care. I, I am not afraid of death. And this, this, this comes up two or three times where she's not afraid to die for what she is passionate about or what she, what she wants to achieve, which we don't really know what that is. Uh, but, and Kari is afraid of death is what she keeps saying. Anyway, so they fight over the crystal and we get this, some of the scenes that we saw in the uh, trailer where she injects it into her armor and becomes super powerful. But of course she can't control it. And Kari has to come in and he wants to save her. So he does it by putting an X-Wing into hyperspace. Really, our duo does this, not him, because mm-hmm. only the droids can make a decision in Star Wars. And so, but he makes his lightsaber super duper long and super, super duper wide and does the OG holdover maneuver right through to Star Wars. But, <laughs> right. but clips just the top of her uh, crystal with the tip of the lightsaber even though it was all the way through the starter where I could get into that and it shatters her armor. It, it destroys it all, but then you're left with you know, the starter square fragment. And then he is off in space and crash lands on Tatooine. Tatooine. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't know the fate of her, right? Like never, right. never she's, said what happened. Yeah. She's floating out in space. And so what's interesting is that Kari and Am are out in space, you know, fighting like they're out in space fighting, but at the end, Am is saved by the droid. Uh, I forgot his, what is it? B2ON. B2N, yeah. Yeah. And he's wearing a helmet, which I just thought was, I, I laughed so hard at that. Like these guys are out there in space, humans, and they don't have any kind of, you know, anything to preserve them from the, from the elements out in space. And yet the droid has a helmet on. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. Um. I mean, there were, so without like, uh, blah, I don't know what I'm trying to say. So this episode is frustrating for me because like I said, uh, visually it was really cool. There were a lot of neat concepts in here. Like you yeah. talked about the Force Vision one, uh, the concept of, you know, twins that were born bred by the Sith, right? We yeah. had the quick flashback of that. It was kind of cool. Like, oh, I want to know more about that. Yeah, you actually got to see them growing in vats and they split the cells. And I mean, there mm-hmm. were some really cool, like, was it like five or six scenes they flashed through? Yeah, yeah, like a little montage they did. Really? Yeah, montage. It was not a montage. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and, and, you know, the whole, the idea that they're both Sith Lords, I guess, or of the dark side. How about that? I don't know if they ever declared themselves as Sith, but certainly dark, uh, dark side users in some way. And then you've got uh, Kare who's like switched, which we have no context of why. Right. It just, he gets out of his, his little emperor looking throne. It looked exactly like the emperor's throne. Right. And, um, and suddenly decides, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to switch over and I'm a good guy. Like he's a really good guy. So like what happened there? Um, we don't really know. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's his love for his sister or the fact that, you know, he knows that the, the crystals are, are there. They can't really control them. The crystals are actually going to control them instead. Um, I, or maybe it's the force vision that changed everything for him in some way. But here's, here's the one thing that I had about the force vision. And of course they didn't get into this, but I was thinking, oh, this is not good. Like he's doing what Anakin, or he's, he's doing what so many other Jedi have done and, right looking into the future and taking action and trying to prevent that from happening. And it didn't sound or look as though there were going to be that, like this was going to go wrong for him. Uh, but I think if they were sticking to traditional star Wars tropes or star Wars themes, this is not a good thing. Like well, this I is always going to backfire. Not, I had a it? different take on it though. He's pulling her into his vo- uh, force vision so she can make a different decision for her own destiny though. 
So I, I had a different perspective on it that he's not doing it for himself specifically. I mean, he wants mm -hmm. to save his sister, but it's also, he's giving her that opportunity that she doesn't know and that she's so consumed with, with, with power and the dark side and, and this over, oh man, this, the, this overconfidence of what she's able to accomplish, how she can control this. And she's not able to, at the end of the day. And so I viewed it more as that he was trying to give her the opportunity. He couldn't save her because he knows she's got to make the choice to do that. He can't do it for her. That's interesting. Yeah, no, I can see that. It, it, well, the, other, the other weird dynamic here is that they're, I guess, dark side users. But then she's talking about the crystal bringing, like she says, it's a beacon of hope. Right. You yeah, know, so which weird. you wouldn't, it's so weird. Like you would not, uh, you would never associate somebody on the dark side or much less a Sith saying that there's hope in the galaxy like hope is not even part of their you know sith the uh, code pretty and yet she's way looking at it yeah. it really is yeah and then um you know kari's his counter argument is no this is just going to bring about disapproval right this is despair. not yeah, despair. despair that's what it was sorry yeah despair um and so that in itself was again there's just a very interesting uh breed of force users i don't i don't know if i don't know if to call them dark side users i don't know if to call them you know, neutral side users or where they're at. But I mean, they're dressed like Sith. Everything's red. I mean, even the droid, you know, B2ON looks like right. triple zero over there. He's like a black uh, protocol droid. Yeah, and their, uh, their costumes are very Vader and Kylo Ren inspired. Yeah, yeah. I saw. So Alm um, reminded me more of like a, Mac a Ralph McQuarrie looking Vader, like real skinny, slender, right. dr long, uh, long lines drawn. And then you had somebody like uh, Kare who was more... Maybe like the maybe the Vader that we got in the movies, but I don't know. Either way, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe more Kylo Ren than in, than anything else. But yeah, and what, um, what's interesting is that they both serve a master, though. So they're mm -hmm. not like they're they're slaves to somebody else. And I think that's what Kari was starting to get to is, you know, you don't have to serve someone. You can actually be free, and and you won't be free unless you start to you know let go of some of this stuff. Yeah. As far as the uh, references, um, we had. Um, the oh, what was it the uh got a bad feeling about this from our duo so almost like uh bb8 said in right. the last jedi said only in the novel um yeah the uh the, the throwbacks of the you know when her helmet comes busting off when that top part breaks and she's just got the two little stems that are in right on her chin uh you know that looks very much like vader at the very end of return of the jedi when luke takes his helmet off um and then the very ending, so that, there's probably more in there. Um, we talked about Punch It and some other stuff in there. But um, towards the very end, though, when we finally get to that whole battle, that the battle is really great. Like, that's that was yeah. the one thing that really excited about this uh, for me when I saw the trailer. And uh, it didn't didn't disappoint. Like, there was some really cool stuff that was happening. And, of course, we're way out in the, the realm of just right. visions stuff with, uh, you know, I don't know. Did she sprout? like eight arms or six arms or whatever what was that like it was like the spider-man armor that she yeah she had. looked like yellow jacket or something from ant man yeah there yeah. you go more like yellow jacket right yeah and, that was she, interesting with when she got powered up from the crystal yeah yeah and the fact that you know she shoots all of those out those eight lightsaber blades or right. whatever beams and you know they're wrapping around his lightsaber and all that stuff. i mean all that's way out there but it was visually it's really cool to look at I mean, the concept of it is really is is really unique because you can see the power going through her armor, and it's just very it's a very unique take on it that you could channel a kyber crystal's energy and power throughout, you know, a set of armor, and you could control it in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of throwing up stuff here on the screen so that we can see. But yeah, I mean, this, there's the orange. I got the yeah. Color. See, she's got like all those arms. Well, then, yeah, the color's all wrong. Well. Yeah, that too. But that's what I got fixated on. Yeah. But I mean, that right there, I mean, that was enough for me when I saw yeah. it. And by this point, I think, didn't he not, was it at this point that he had already put his kyber crystal into his existing lightsaber? Yeah, he put it in before he ever ignited it. Right, okay. Because you can see the blade has like this pinkish, pinkish hue up to a blue. It's got this kind of shimmering type of light to it. And when, when of course, it goes crazy big, you can see all the different colors in it. Mm -hmm. And this is where it's starting to control her. Again, right. visually, this is really neat stuff. Um, there was something soothing about the X-Wing sound, by the way. This X-Wing is like the most durable X-Wing ever because it <laughs> crashes across the surface of the Star Destroyer. And it you know, looks like it's right as rain, but then when it crashes yeah. in Tatooine, it's junk. 
Um, when he says get ready to punch it right before he does his holdo maneuver, if you want to call it that, right. uh, the music in there is right out of episode four. Like it's uh, yeah. maybe not exactly, but that was the only time that I took a note of the music. So it was kind of cool to kind of, to kind of hear that. And, uh, at this part, um, yeah. Uh, you know, and then they, they display some pretty cool, like this is almost, I thought he was going to go rip under the belly of it. I know I keep bringing that up because it was one of the, in the concept art for, the Force Awakens. Um, there was a, at one point during the production, Ray was going to kind of hang her arm or hang her head outside the the uh, ride around in a X wing, and she was going to be had her lightsaber ignited, and she was going to be running, making runs up and down the belly of a star destroyer, and kind of tearing it open with that. And I always thought that visually that'd be kind of cool. Now, probably not practical, but when he got up on the on the front of this thing, I thought, oh wow, he's going to like do this like he's gonna go rip up the bottom no this dude goes like right through it um with the lightsaber made it long enough so that it could go through that and then sorry i don't want to get into the physics of it oh, yeah, already, he, he, he goes on the he flips upside down around. yeah mm -hmm. so he, he's on the bottom of the ship but yeah then he makes the lightsaber huge except for what he's gonna clip the crystal on the armor it's really confusing how this works there was um not there so a long time ago so it was it, far, far away. Yeah, no. So in Splinter of the Mind's Eye, I want to really go back here, but in Splinter right. of the Mind's Eye, that was the first time I remember remember lightsabers being able to be adjusted, like the blade lengths. You know what I mean? Yeah. And for a very long time in, well, not that there was a lot of legend stuff after that or, or EU stuff after that, but um, it wasn't again until Star Wars Rebels that... Um, Kanan was teaching Ezra at one point and he was showing him that you could adjust the lightsaber blade. So I was like, oh, okay, so I guess it's back. And I couldn't remember if they'd ever, they'd ever done that in Clone Wars, to be honest. You but, know, Ahsoka's blades were different lengths too. Mm -hmm. so, well, see, I, mean, I always thought, I always thought she had one. Well, yeah, so I think, I always saw hers as, she had a full-size blade, but then she had her little, uh, what do they call those? Shoto blades? Like the shorter, right. shorter uh, samurai blades um, that they would use. Still and I thought be the thought, same principle though, right? I don't know. That's a good question. I, don't, I have no idea. I just thought that was, like it, I, it, she couldn't adjust the size. That's just the, the size that it was. Okay. I don't know. I mean, Yoda's, yeah, Yoda's little too. Of course, he's got a little help too. But yeah, I don't know. He's a, he's a little guy. He's a little guy. But, but the point is, like the, uh, no pun intended, the point is they could uh, make these blades different lengths. And so it, the, what right. we saw wasn't necessarily um, unfamiliar, but to the extent in which he extended it was very unfamiliar. Um, and then later on, when we get to like, um, was it the Ninth Jedi? Um, and that whole thing, I think, wasn't, didn't she make it? She was able to adjust the size or something like yeah. that too, as yeah. well. So it was interesting that they pulled that out because we don't see it a lot in canon. And yet, in two episodes, in the span of, you know, in, in the span of nine episodes, two of the episodes were call making callbacks to being able to extend the links of the blade. So maybe it was convenient for the story or not, but I just thought that was a neat right. thing they did. Yeah. And this one was more of a, using the force to manipulate the kyber crystal i think but in general yeah i think it's an interesting concept to keep going back to and there's the yep. tribute to ryan johnson's the last jedi did they was there sound on this one they they did have no, sound right it was no it was silent they went silent as well yeah oh, there was okay. no, and there was no and there was no and there was no eruption afterwards or anything like that mm -hmm. um yeah so yeah, like you said, eventually um, he that's him heading there to what I believe is you know, Tatooine because later on when he lands and his <laughs> it's so funny his ships just like head first into the uh, the sand there, um, and then we get the of course the twin suns setting and uh, he, I think he mentions that he can still feel his sister so somehow she survived with no helmet and this kyber crystal being ripped out of that armor which uh, the idea the concept of we didn't really touch on this but the concept of dark armor an armor that's powered by kyber crystals. Uh, that's, that feels like it'd be something they may toy with like in the High Republic, right? Because they, we know that High Re the, they use their lightsabers to power all yeah. of their, sh the vectors and the ground ships. And, uh, you know, Jacassa and you pulls out that lightsaber rifle, which I have a feeling we're going to see again in the High Republic at some point when they go to war uh, officially. But, um, but yeah, I mean, this is not, this would be kind of cool if they actually came up with a way to have their armor powered up by a kyber crystal and not to get in the high republic but i don't know that's gonna really buy them much or do much for them but still kind of neat concept that i don't think we've ever seen before oh yeah. uh, let's see let's see this 
This guy says, uh, there was a lightsaber diagram that came out around episode one that showed one switch was a blade extender. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it's always been there, but it's like you just don't ever visually see it much. It's never used as much in canon. And uh, the point was that they, they did it twice in the span of like right. 30 minutes if you count both episodes together. So, yeah. um, I don't know. What else do you want to say about this one? I think that's about it. Uh, it was... I, I, again, I think this is something that could be revisited and I would like to read and, and look at this in a graphic novel or comic book type of way, maybe rather than on, on screen. And I don't know why that is. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I think you could probably just go through it a lot more and take your time and pace it through without trying to cram it into 10 or 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I like the, there are some things that just work better in different mediums. And I, I think this is one of those that might work really, really well. Uh, in a, in a print form. Yep. But, but yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, still had a lot of enjoyable moments, like you said. It's, yeah. it, 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 these are meant to be a lot of fun and to be very different. And they are absolutely hitting the mark in those ways. And I, I think that's totally cool. And I think that's great. I don't, I don't, we can have our criticisms about them, but I think that they're hitting the mark of what they wanted to do. And I think we're getting some really interesting ways of looking at it. And I think there's something in every single one of these episodes, there's always something that's really good that i think you could take out of it that you, there's a piece that you can really enjoy in each one of them and I don't, yeah so uh, some of the folks that want to be negative about it i think they just want to be negative oh yeah there's always going to be those guys out there yep okay well i think that's we'll leave it here um i think so next week we'll come back and we'll do the next three episodes so you'll get uh the village bride the ninth jedi and oh boy what was the last one the T T zero B one. You've got it open right there in your screen. <laughs> yes, T zero. Yeah, T zero B one. <laughs> That's what I haven't seen yet. I haven't seen that one or Akira. Or Akira. Oh, the, the last one. Yeah, uh, the last one. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. so. Yeah, we'll talk about those. We'll have a lot to say about the Ninth Jedi. In fact, we'll probably spend the mo majority of the time on the Ninth Jedi. I'll probably have a whole all episode the, on Ninth. Oh, the Village Bride though. I thought Village yeah. Bride was really good, and I, I kind of felt like it was going to be a dark horse, and it it was, and I. I thought that one was really, really good. Yeah. Really no, good. I'm with you there. So, but I don't know that we'll spend a lot of time on. Well, the elders in there too, in there. No, that's in the next one. Oh, in the okay. That's yeah. We'll get seven. the elder, uh, Lopen Oko or Ocho and then Akakiti will be the last one. Gotcha. So, all right. Hopefully you guys enjoy this. Uh, again, we didn't want to break down every single thing, but we figured it, it's worth dedicating some time to given it's, uh, you know, total of nine episodes and, uh, it'd be a nice lead in until we can finally talk about Ronin, the book, which yeah. again comes out October 12th. All right. Any final words before we get out of here? I think that's about it. Send us off to a galaxy far, far away, Albert. I'm going to punch it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay. Uh, we'll roll the credits and uh, we're going to, we get to use the, uh, the special, um, the uh, visions credits that we made. We only got to use those once. So, and oh, I think we used cool. them for Patreon. That was the only time we used them. So. Yeah, thanks for being here. We'll see you guys next Tuesday. And thanks to everybody that came and joined us in the chat. Oh, yeah, we got uh, Chris. We got uh, Alejandro, your brother. Uh, Tuan, Kathy, Steph, Risk. Oh, goodness. We had other people. Uh, Ryman 6000 early on. Uh, Leland, Chef Chris. Yep, yep. Uh, Mike Mike Rondo, you can you can just stay home. Yeah, Leland Henry. Katia was there earlier on. Uh, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple. I apologize if so. But thank you guys for coming out. We know we had people kind of lingering in the background, too. But we appreciate you being here and certainly uh, give us a follow on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch. You can see the live stream every week. Thank you, stalkers, too, for not saying anything. We appreciate right. you always. Yeah. And hey, we have a we have a great channel out in Discord talking about all this stuff. So here gluemedia.com slash Discord. And we'll be back. We'll be back later this week to do a Patreon episode. We have one. We're just not gonna do it tonight because I'm exhausted. No, sorry, I didn't tell you Dungey, but next time. Every day is a surprise with you, Mr. Padilla. <laughs> yeah. Okay. With that, we'll see you guys next week. You're still listening? Wow, that's amazing. Well, I'm here to give you the disclaimer. Normally we do a big, long, drawn-out disclaimer thing saying what's what and who's what and all that other stuff, but I think you guys kind of know that Lucasfilm and Disney have uh, no affiliation with us at all, uh, and we have none with them. Uh, we talk about Star Wars, which is their property and all that other good, fun stuff. Uh, but I think you can tell which is our stuff and which is their stuff. If you can't, well, then send a lawyer to send an email to me and I'll be glad to chat with them. Other than that, you know what's what. So that's your disclaimer. 